I'm talking today to Dion Mas, who is a uh, TV producer, author and documentary maker and runs a company called Meerkat Productions. Their latest documentary is called Punk in Africa. Dion, this sounds an unlikely topic. Tell me how punk started in South Africa. Well, I think we should first speak about how unlikely the subject is because um, I think that plays a huge role in people paying attention to the film that wouldn't ordinarily because they, they don't expect punk to have happened in Africa. Um, the, the punk thing in Africa happened virtually weeks within it having started in, um, in the UK or started being very well known in the UK. Um, we had a, um, the, the pre thatcherite England had a lot of uh, uh, people with certain skills that, that came into South Africa from the UK. Um, where uh, it was very, uh, and they, they brought that whole culture with them. So a lot of them came to work on the, uh, on, um, the uh, petrochemical plants at Sassol and Secunda and also in Joburg on the East Rand, and they brought that with them. Obviously, uh, some of the first bands primarily um, were interested in imitating the, the, uh, what was happening in the UK, uh, but literally within a few months, it, they started incorporating lots of African rhythms. Um, so you basically had punk with African influences. And it was also obviously because of apartheid, um, it was a very political movement um, with a very politically uh, sensitive lyrics, which led to a lot of bands uh, being banned, which is one of the reasons why the scene is mainly forgotten now, nowadays um, and why this movie was so important to make. How could you be a punk in appearance in South Africa in, in what was really an extremely conventional society that was also tightly controlled in terms of security? Um, visually you had to be careful. Um, a lot of people would actually kind of have two, two, two looks, you know, the one when they left the house and the one when they got to the gig. Um, a lot of people like myself, I used to shave my head for the whole skinhead look, which was closer to the whole, you know, old school Buddha mentality, uh, where it was perfectly acceptable to actually have a very, very, very short no hair time. on your head. Yeah. Well, not no hair, but like you know, number one or number two. It was. It was as a matter of fact, you were thought to be pretty cool and pretty close to the cause, i.e. the National Party apartheid mm. thing, if you had that kind of hairstyle. So a lot of guys opted for that. Um, a lot of the guys just had slightly longer hair, but there were no green Dayglo Mohicans. Uh, but you wore the docks and, and the skinny jeans, which you got your mother to, to uh, trim down for you. The film itself actually is about punk in Zimbabwe and Mozambique. As well, yes. Yes. And, and what happened in those two countries in terms of... Yes. Well, I mean, uh, so South Africa has always been... Uh, I mean, the, the film focuses on, on South Africa, Zimbabwe and Mozambique because they were the last three countries in Africa to be liberated. Um, so, it, it, uh, you know, while, the, while the, the rest of the, the Western world was going through this youth revolution in the 60s and the 70s, we had apartheid in South Africa um, and, uh, you know, Zim Zimbabwe was this unilateral declaration of independence with Ian Smith and the government. Uh, Mozambique um, was going through a civil war that, that was being uh, largely supported by uh, the West and, and South Africa more specifically. So uh, um, the, 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 the punk movement in South Africa spilled over into these countries um, and started having an influence, um, especially um, in Mozambique in the 90s, uh, uh, the late 80s, early 90s, when they still had their civil war going. Um, and currently in Zimbabwe, the, the punk scene is just getting well, bigger and bigger. It's gone from one band to two bands to three bands to four bands, you know. And what are those bands playing now? Well, they, the, the, the Zimbabwean bands are playing old standard three-chord punk, which, the, which they combine with Timurengo guitars, you know, the whole four-to-the-floor thing, which seems to, like, really connect with punk. Um, and they have a lot of... Um, um, uh, traditional African backing vocals in it. So, so it's the three-chord punk, like when, when the, the solo part comes or the bridge comes, they use the chimarenga thing with, with, the, with the backing vocals. The Mozambican stuff is, is more influenced by metal um, uh, from uh, especially uh, South America, being a Portuguese-speaking country. Um, but there's also a lot of dub going on around there, which is incorporated with the punk. Um, and there's, uh, uh, the, the Mozambican scene is much more advanced musically. Uh, they just seem to be more 
musical whereas the Zimbabwean guys are like four to the floor head, heads in the, in the speaker mm. bins kind of thing you know? and what are, what, what are the bands that um, are in Zimbabwe that represent this kind of music well there's the, the, the band in Zimbabwe that, uh, for, uh, that we feature in the film is called Evicted uh, which is obviously a, a direct play on the on the um, whole rand, rand, land restitution thing that's going on there but with three of the four members of the band actually having been involved in situations where they were forced off their form including one of the black members of, of, of the band um, the, um, the Mozambican scene for us is very much represented by a band called 340 Mall um, which uh, uh, spends time between Johannesburg and Maputo um, and and uh, uh, there, there are lots of these bands going on. I mean, there's a hardcore scene going on in Dar es Salaam. There's a, a, a total DIY punk scene in Nairobi. Uh, Cape Verde, there's a scene. Um, but these are all things that are starting out now because mm. the, the whole punk thing is becoming more popular in Africa because, uh, firstly... You were saying in South Africa it has revived. It, well, South Africa was, was, uh, was revived very much... Um, over the past few years, because people are getting upset again with the government, especially the Afrikaans people who feel very insecure in their own country, um, so there's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of angry young people uh, who have a lot to say, and and I love that. I mean, I I'm a firm believer in the fact that uh, um, you can't have a revolution by starting a Facebook page. You know, you you uh, you've got to burn shit. You know, mm. otherwise it can't work. And and for me, it's nice to see that there's a new generation of South Africans that are actually taking up um, the battle because the the generation that came directly after '94, um, they were just interested in partying and spending. You know, daddy's newfound money. Um, but now things are, people are getting angry. You see it with the hip hop groups as well, uh, groups like Amu and, uh, and Squatter Camp. There's a lot of anger busy coming through, a lot of criticism of the government. And how was the film financed? Um, okay, we, we, we got a little bit of money, and by a little bit I really mean a small amount of money, um, from the National Film and Video Foundation. That was 3,000 euros. No, there was about just under, uh, just under 10,000 euros in total that okay. we got from them. Um, then we, we used uh, 2,500 euros of that money, which they, they gave to us, out of, which they don't usually do, to, to make a promo for the film. Um, and uh, we luckily with Meerkat Media, um, we, we have an infrastructure, we have editing facilities, we have camera, mm. we have sound equipment, um, we have a vehicle, you know, um, so, so we used the money to make the promo, then um, we got the, the promo on the internet, uh, we had a Facebook site, uh, MySpace, um, and, a, and a website, um, and, and started using it to, to actually start tracking these people down, because a lot of them, we, mm. we didn't even know who they were. We, we tracked people down in Los Angeles, Prague, um, London, and, and, and Durban, you know, people who've gone underground since they re retired from the punk scene in the 80s. Because and were they surprised to see you come walking through the door? You know, initially it, it was actually quite, quite interesting because initially people, uh, people didn't want to be part of it. Um, people, I think a lot of people still have severe uh, psychological scars um, uh, because of the movement, because people were literally run out of the country. Um, some people totally went totally underground and away from the scene because they were worried about their families and their, their children. Um, so for a lot of people, it's a, it was a bad era that they closed the door on. And I think a lot, of them, um, um, were, a lot of them were scared to open that door again. Once we got in the position where we convinced them that, um, that we were telling the, the, the ultimate story about punk in South Africa, um, and, and that if they weren't in the movie, they were going to be forgotten about by history in, in total. People started coming around, and um, it still, still took quite a lot of time uh, to convince some people, but in the end, I think for a lot of them, I mean, uh, more than one of the guys literally sat on the pavement after we finished shooting and just started crying, you know? Because I think for a lot of them, they haven't really had closure on the whole issue. I think for a lot of people, there's still a lot of noises in their head, mm. you know, um, things that um, 
it, it's not something that, that ended nicely for a lot of people, including myself, you know. I mean, um, I was part of a whole scene and, and for me to make this film was almost like a, it was almost like a therapy session, just getting all, mm. all these noises out of my head. And I think for a lot of the, the people in the film, it was as well. 